Good evening and welcome. This is our fourth in our Lenten series on dedicated to St. Joseph. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome Monsignor Martin Schlag. He is a professor in the Catholic Studies Department at the University of St. Thomas, native of Rome. Um, Father Joseph tells me everywhere he goes in Europe, somebody knows Monsignor Martin, so uh, I'll, I'll take that on good advice. Um, he's gonna be speaking this evening on St. Joseph, uh, patron of the worker, and I, I know this is, of all the five topics, this is the one I'm most looking forward to. So without further ado, Monsignor Schleich. Well, good evening, everyone. Also those uh, watching us on, on the screens. And uh, I would like to start acknowledging the presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist and um, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here in the Holy Eucharist, in the tabernacle. You are there to love us and to teach us to love. You can hear us, you can see us, you look at us full of love. We adore you with profound reverence. We ask you to make this encounter, this time of prayer, this meditation fruitful. And we also ask you for forgiveness of our sins to help us to be better Christians. And we turn to our mother Mary, we turn to our father, and Lord Saint Joseph and to our guardian angel to intercede for us. So uh, one thing that uh, uh, was forgotten in the introduction, <laughs> which was so kind, is that I'm a priest of Opus Dei. And uh, uh, our founder is Saint Jose Maria, who loved Saint Joseph, loved him very much. And uh, if you visit the central house of Opus Dei in Rome, you can see a bas-relief of Our Lady with a very conspicuous gold ring on her finger in order to make clear she was married to St. Joseph and it was real marriage. And um, they both lived virginity and parenthood at the same time. And St. Joseph was young and strong and chaste. Uh, Saint Jose Maria used to say uh, he got angry if he was depicted as an old man, um, as if a young man could not be chaste. And at the same time, Saint Joseph was more father of Jesus than a biological father would have been. He taught him also his profession. Saint Joseph was a worker. He was a woodworker, a carpenter, we don't exactly know what he was. Uh, the Greek word technon can mean different things, but he uh, worked well. And why do we know that? Well, because Jesus worked well. And why do we know that? Well, we don't really have any direct description of how Jesus worked, but we do know that human beings um, have a unity of their personality. So, if Jesus, in the three years of his public ministry, worked the way he did, he probably worked the same way, very probably, worked the same way in his profession. And let us think of how he worked in his public life. He transformed water into wine, uh, the first miracle that he performed. And I'm always surprised, you know, why such a miracle? Why not? Rising, raising someone from the dead or healing someone, why changing water into wine? Something which is kind of maybe even scandalous for some people. Um, but the rabbis had a list of works of mercy. And the first work of mercy was to help a bride and a bridegroom marry 
So Jesus begins his public ministry with a work of mercy. And there he changes water, not into any kind of wine, but he changes it into excellent wine and in great amounts, you know. And then we see him walk miles and miles. We see him spend nights in vigil. We see him perform miracles that immediately heal people so that they can get up and walk or serve. The fever is gone. There are no consequences of fever. And then we see how he created the church and he thought up a miracle like the Holy Eucharist where he invented a method so that he could stay with us even though he had to leave. That was the way he redeemed us. And so he must have worked the same way. He must have tried to be perfect, as perfect as possible, uh, in the exercise of his profession. So much so that when he started speaking, he was known as the carpenter. He was not known as the funny guy or the one who could tell good stories, but he was known by his professional title, the architect, or whatever we would say nowadays. And so much did Jesus unite his profession with his redemption that in his death, Jesus was not strangled with a fishnet, he was not decapitated with a sword, um, he was not whatever other way of death, but he used the tools of his own work, hammer, nail, and wood, the, the tools of his profession, those were the tools of his redemption with which he was crucified. So our Lord in those 30 years um, was not wasting his time. He was already sanctifying work. And so um, if we look at St. Joseph, and again, uh, that's what happens if you invite a priest of Opus Dei, to, to speak, well, I talk a lot about St. Josemaria, and I recommend a, a homily that he, uh, he wrote. It's in a, published in a, in a little booklet called Christ is Passing By, and it's called In Joseph's Workshop. And it's on the sanctification of work. So when I started reading it, or rereading it a few days ago to prepare uh, this encounter with you, um, what I expected was that he would immediately start with his formula. And his formula is sanctify work, sanctify yourself in your work, sanctify others through your work. And I remember a story that uh, once a group of pilgrims came to Rome to pray at the tomb of, of Saint Jose Maria, and I made a mistake. I asked them whether they wanted to pray first or have a conversation first. And uh, they said, well, we want to talk first. And so uh, we ended up talking for nearly an hour, and then they only had two minutes time to pray. So next time I know, first prayer, and then we can talk. So there was a group of people, and they were all asking questions, and I was answering as well as I could. And there was one lady who was looking at me all the time with a frown. And she was very serious, and she never said anything. And there was another young lady who um, kept on asking questions, and uh, at one point she said, well, could you just summarize, you know, what's the, 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 the short version, the elevator pitch of what St. Jose Maria said? And so it came to my mind to repeat this formula, you know, sanctify work, sanctify yourself in your work, sanctify others through your work. And, you know, after 50 minutes or so, the, the lady who was looking at me with this frown, she sh raised her hand and said, uh, can I ask a question? So I thought, okay, here comes, you know, here comes uh, the thing she's not happy about. She said, could you repeat that formula for me, those three things with sanctification of work? Because I want to write it down uh, on a post-it and put it next to my telephone. You know? um, so I thought, well, see, I was thinking she was uh, not happy, but she was just so concentrated. So as I said, I thought when I reread the homily in Joseph's workshop that St. Josemaria would start speaking about this. But 
surprisingly for me, he starts with our vocation, with your vocation. He starts with this calling of God to, of each one of us. And he says, a vocation is a light that gives meaning to our whole existence, to our past, to our present, to our future. And our vocation is the reason why we were born and why we live. So I think here in the presence of God, I think it's good, a good moment to ask ourselves, have I discovered my vocation? Have I discovered that my life as a Christian is a vocation? Maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, being Christian was a fact. If you were born into a Catholic family, you were baptized and you were raised a Catholic, you had institutions, Catholic schools, which took care of you, and you had a society that more or less abided by natural law. You had support. But nowadays, it's so clear that being a Christian means taking a stand, going upstream. It's, it's a vocation. We're more and more like the early Christians in Roman society, where being a Christian meant you couldn't go to the amphitheater anymore. You couldn't go to the, to the games. And enemies of yours could easily point you out to the authorities, and it meant giving your life. So first comes our vocation. And our vocation gives us a new perspective on life. It's like adding a new dimension. If we live in two dimensions, then everything is flat. And the vocation adds a, adds a dimension. Like, all of a sudden, we have volume. There are three dimensions. And there's a, a nice point in another booklet uh, by Saint Jose Maria that came out after his death, where he copies from a letter that kind of describes this discovery of someone of their vocation. You're writing to me in the kitchen by the stove. It is early afternoon. It is cold. By your side, your youngest sister, the last one to discover the divine folly of living her Christian vocation to the full, is peeling potatoes. To all appearances, you think, her work is the same as before. And yet, what a difference there is. It is true. Before, she only peeled potatoes. Now, she is sanctifying herself peeling potatoes. That's this new dimension. I remember once in Rome, uh, we had a student at my university, a priest, who had been sent by his bishop to write a doctorate. And, you know, maybe you think, oh, wow, that's the coolest thing that could ever happen to me, uh, being sent to Rome by my bishop to write a doctorate. Well, this poor priest didn't find it that cool. Uh, actually, he, he wasn't happy. Uh, but, he, you know, he knew my bishop, I have to obey, and my bishop kind of represents God for me. And, and so he, he obeyed and, and did his best and was really putting in a lot of goodwill. And he came to a recollection. And at the end of the recollection, he said, wow, I've made a great discovery. You know, up to now, I thought that I was here in Rome because God wanted me to be here and write a thesis because my bishop told me to do so. But now I have discovered God wants me to become holy by writing a thesis. He, God had given him this, this gift, this, this grace, that it's, it's, it's about becoming holy. And so maybe... When you think of yourself, think, well, vocation. Me, a vocation? Well, um, I'm not going to be a priest. I'm not, I don't feel a religious vocation. How can my life be a vocation? And, well, actually, the same consideration 
led St. Josemaria at the beginning not to use the word vocation when he spoke to lay people, but he called it calling, a calling. Um, because he, did, he wanted to avoid thinking that your vocation as a lay person is like a adaptation of a religious vocation to your circumstances. Like, well, okay, let's take, I don't know, a, a very strict religious vocation, let's dilute it, and let's make it, let's adapt it to lay people. He said, no, it's a truly lay vocation. So sometimes we can think, well, you know, sure, uh, married people can also be holy. You know, they can also be holy, even though, poor things, you know, uh, they're so distracted by their family, they have to work, uh, they can't dedicate themselves to God all the time because they have to work and, you know, it's busy, and, but they can still be holy, you know. Uh, even though, you know, and well, it's the other way around. It's because you are in the world, because you have a family. That is where God is waiting for you. And this vocation is not a second category, but it is heroic. And this is what St. Joseph, in his life, teaches us. It's what he taught Jesus throughout 30 years. Be heroic in, through, and beyond the daily duties, in the world, in your work, uh, not by withdrawing from your work, not by avoiding what is difficult. Uh, but this in, in the world, can also be ambiguous. It can, it can be understood as, well, yes, um, it is in the world, but it is despite the world. It's uh, not thanks to the world. And that's why it is also through the world, through uh, our activities. Any honest, serious activity that contributes to the common good, that is the stuff out of which our holiness is made. The work of our hands, uh, our participation, in the division of labor in society, and then beyond, beyond our work. This is not the last reality. Work must not become an idol. Uh, the affirmation of the world and of the goodness of the world must not make us blind to sin. We need always to keep in mind that there is transcendence, that God is the completely other, that his existence in the world is not that he's part of the world, that he's, he's the completely different, the completely other, and that the Sabbath, the rest, and the spirit of contemplation in our work gives us this freedom always to venerate our creator, to adore our creator in what we do. So sanctifying our work means bringing our work in connection with the cross. The only sacrifice that God the Father recognizes as a sacrifice, as an offering that we can give to him, is the sacrifice of his son on the cross. Only the cross, once and for all, atoned for all our sins and reconciled us to God. And that sacrifice of the cross is made present every day in the Eucharist. So sanctification of work circles around the Holy Mass. The Mass is like the hinge around which everything else turns in our Christian life. So you have a vocation to holiness, and you have a vocation in your work to holiness. And in German, um, that is my, my second mother tongue, uh, the word for work is beruf. And the word beruf comes from the word berufung, which means vocation. And uh, this word beruf was created or made popular 
by Martin Luther. Martin Luther, uh, as you know, did away with the medieval notion that there was a group of people who were specifically called to be holy, the monks and the religious. And there was a division of labor in the medieval world. You had the peasants and the farmers who fed everyone and worked for everyone. You had the knights who fought for everyone. And then you had the monks who prayed for everyone. And so you paid the monks or you endowed their monasteries in order to pray what you didn't pray, to pray for the eternal rest of the souls. And so Martin Luther did away with that, and he said, your vocation is where you are in the world. But he went too far. He said, that's the only vocation that exists. There is no religious vocation, and the priesthood is not sacramental. Now, I always thought that in the Middle Ages, there was no real theology of the work. You know, that in the Bible, we see Jesus as a worker. We read in St. Paul, who says, somebody who does not want to work should not eat. Um, and St. Augustine had to defend this principle in the first monasteries because the children of the rich said, well, we don't work. We only dedicate ourselves to study and prayer. We're not going to do manual work. And St. Augustine said, no, you have to work. But then uh, over the centuries, this was kind of forgotten. And work was seen mainly as an instrument against idleness. So you find among the Desert Fathers the task of weaving baskets. So throughout the day, they were weaving baskets in order to keep their minds busy. And while they were doing that, they were praying. But then in the evening, they undid the baskets to redo them the next day, because it was mainly about just not being idle, having something to do. Uh, so I thought, well, that's, that's not much, you know? And then there was like a thousand years of nothing, and then Martin Luther came out of nowhere. Well, um, now I know, after having read Patricia Ranft and her studies on Peter Damien and the 11th century, the religious renewal of the 11th century, that that was not the case. There was a deep respect for work, also in the centuries before Martin Luther. And Peter Damien was one of the great reformers um, in the 11th century. He reacted against an exaggeration of the Benedictine monks in Cluny, who had um, interpreted the passage in the rule of Saint Benedict that nothing should be given precedence over liturgy. So liturgy was the most important thing. So what they did was they prayed 24-7. They had a constant liturgy. That was their work. And they, had, they took turns, obviously, and, and they distributed the constant hours of prayer among uh, all the members of the, the monastery, the abbey. Um, but that was their work. You know? And Peter Damien said, no, that is not enough. Uh, the liturgy is very important, but we also need human work. And we need it as witness to the world based on what we call in theology prophetic eschatology. Eschatology is um, the teaching of the church on the last things, on the end of the world, on the final judgment, um, the resurrection of the dead, the coming of our Lord, and for us individually, personal judgment, purgatory, hell, or heaven. And there are two ways of understanding eschatology. One is in the sense of an apocalyptic eschatology, which would mean everything that exists will be destroyed, and then God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Well, that is not the Catholic under understanding of how it will be, how the new heavens and the new earth will be. But the Second Vatican Council, taking up the tradition of the centuries, said everything good that we do will stay, but transformed. So the new heavens and the new earth are a transformation of what already exists. So grace is like a seed of glory 
like the apple tree is already contained in the little apple seed, so heaven is already contained in earth. Uh, what we sow here will bring fruit uh, in, uh, in eternity. So uh, Peter Damien, based on this belief of, a, of what we call this prophetic eschatology, the sense of um, we um, prophecy, we point out what is unjust in the world and we try to overcome it. We try to live here by the rules of heaven. So work as witness to the world based on prophetic eschatology. But it was concentrated in religious life. So it was the religious orders, the Cistercians, and the many the, the uh, regular canons and so on who taught this. But it was always you needed this religious calling. It was lay people when were, were, were not the focus. And that is where, yes, Martin Luther did come in, but in an exaggerated, in, in an exaggerated way by abolishing religious life. And, and so uh, it, it is Saint Jose Maria who at the beginning of the 20th century spoke of professional vocation, vocacion profesional in Spanish. And he was accused of being a Protestant, so a Protestant heretic because he was teaching that lay people could become holy by sanctifying their work. At that time, that was unheard of. He was accused at the Inquisition, um, as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was called at that time, uh, but he was acquitted. It didn't, it didn't go anywhere. So work is a path of holiness, sanctifying your work sanctifying yourself in your work, sanctifying others through your work. And work is part of human life, and it was part of the original plan of God for man and woman before the fall, before original sin, man and woman were placed in the garden in order to cultivate it and to protect it. Work is part of our dignity as image of God. Remember, in Genesis we read, God created man and woman as his image, and then he says, subdue the world, be my steward. God, the overlord over all creation, entrusts the world and the shaping of the world to man and woman. Uh, we develop our personality through work. We bond with others. We live in a society that has, you know, specialized in many branches of division of labor. Uh, we make me a meaningful contribution to society through our work. That's why it's so dangerous um, to think that we could ever just live off the state or off government or off government handouts? So, well, it's, all, it's only about money. It's not. It's about making a meaningful contribution to the common good, being respected as somebody who can give, not only receive. And it's support for our work is also the means of support for our family. And for us Christians, Work also means a participation in redemption with Christ. Remember the story of Pope Francis as a young man when he was 19 years old or so. He had half of his lung taken out in an operation. It was very painful and he was, you know, um, in the ICU or in the hospital. He was, and many people came to see him and no one was able to console him. And no one was able to really give him a meaning of what was going on in his life. Until a nun came and said, you are now redeeming with Christ. You are now united with Christ on the cross and you are redeeming the world with him. So this is what we do in our work and especially when we encounter difficulties. So when I was a young boy, a teenager, uh, I was told, your human vocation is part of your divine vocation. 
And I rejoiced. You know, I, I had, as a 12-year-old, I had uh, uh, gone into the chapel in our school one day, and there was a, there was a, a prayer book. And I opened it, and I read, uh, God, I give you all my plans for the future. And I said, no way. <laughs> no way. That's, I, no, no, that's too much. You can't ask that. And I read it again. I give you all my plans for the future. I said, no, no, don't insist. You know? Then I read it a third time. I said, I give you all my plans for the future. And then I said, oh, okay, yes. So I gave God a check, a blank check, you know, carte blanche. And I, so I'd, after, years afterwards, I found that passage again, and it doesn't even say that. It, it says, uh, I give you all my plans that contradict your will, you know, and that would have been negotiable. Like, okay, I won't sin, yeah, I'll be good, and so on. But it was like, it was unconditional. God asked unconditional surrender of me to his will. And I didn't know what it meant. You know? So, well, I was thinking priesthood, but at the same time, I, I wanted to have a family. I wanted to be a scientist or, you know, be a leader in, in government. And, and so one day, a, week, we, a new chaplain came into our school, and I told him about this. And oh, he said, you can do both. You can do both. You can give yourself completely to God, unconditionally, um, 100%, uh, radically, you know, and at the same time stay in the world. And, and I thought, yeah, that's what I want. You know? And then gave me this booklet, The Way, um, and I loved it. And uh, since then, more or less, my vocation has been clear. Uh, sometimes I doubted whether I wanted it, or I doubted whether uh, I had the strength, but I could never doubt that God wanted me to do this. <laughs> so there's, it's an important difference between, uh, you know, what does God want and what do I want? <laughs> Not the same thing. So we are so close to the feast of, to the solemnity of St. Joseph. So I thought, well, we're talking about sanctifying our work following our vocation, discovering our life as a vocation. So what could we do on, on that day? And there's a Spanish expression, which is renovar la entrega. And it's so difficult to translate this. Um, entrega is to give something. So if you give a letter, entregar una carta, you give a letter. But it actually also means well, in this uh, context, self-giving, commitment, surrender. You know? I think it's a good day to renew our surrender to God's will. God, I give you all my plans. I give you all my life. I give you everything. I let go of myself. And renewal, renew this self-giving, the surrender, doesn't actually necessarily mean doing anything else. Sometimes we think, oh, self-giving means I have to leave everything. Or I'm sure God will ask me something which is really horrible. You know? And we make God like, we make, we make him into a monster. You know? No, it probably means stay where you are. Be faithful. Continue uh, in the same spot where you are, with the same people, with the same family, in the same job, with the same difficulties. No. But make the same things young again. Remember this terrible passage in the book of Revelation where God says, I know your your deeds. I know how much you do, but I hold against you that you have lost your first love. And that always kind of gives me a lot to think about. My first love, my first enthusiasm, when things were new. Um, 
finishing things can be heroic. All, it's always nice to start something, but then bring it to the end, you know, persevere. And so renew our self-giving to God in our work, I think always makes us think of love. We, we, we don't work like slaves, we work like children. In the parable of the prodigal son, there are these two sons, and the older son stays in the house of his father, but he also needs conversion because he works like a slave. He doesn't feel free. He works with resentment, with a grudge, and uh, he's not happy. He's not full of love. So he needs to renew his self-giving, his surrender. Uh, bees produce perfect honeycombs. You know, I, every, every year when it t takes place, I go to the state fair and I, I love going to the bees. And last time, two years ago, they told me, well, look, the bees, they hatch and two seconds later, they already work. You know, they don't have to go to school. They don't need college. You know, they, they just start working. And, and so that's, but they don't work. It's wrong. They follow their instincts. Bees produce something. They produce honey. They produce perfect combs. But they cannot work because they cannot love. We, we alone can work. It's a human privilege to be able to work. So out of love and with love. Out of love is the motive why we work. And uh, sometimes we can, when we feel tired or we don't feel like doing something, then it's good to think of Jesus on the cross. And, you know, I like these crosses without a corpus because it reminds us I have to be that corpus. And, and um, it's waiting for me. It's waiting for me. And it's not a tragedy. The cross is the throne of Jesus as king. That was the weapon with which he conquered us, conquered our happiness, conquered our heaven. And we work with love. Um, with love means looking at the details. Saint Josemaria used to take the young men whom he was accompanying in spiritual direction up the spires of the cathedral of Burgos in Spain. And he would take them right as far as you can get and to the gargoyles and those little turrets or whatever that you could see up there. And he said, look, they are perfect. The craftsmen who were working on these knew that nobody from below could, could see them. But they are worked right to the last detail. They are finished. They're perfected. The faces, the, the, the leaves, uh, you know, the animals that are there, they're only for God. They're only for God's glory. You know? We sometimes work too much thinking of what will the others say, and when nobody sees it, well, we, we are sloppy, maybe. So renewing our uh, self-giving to God in our vocation, in work, means letting God suck all the evil out of my heart every day. Every day is a new decision to either work for God or work for myself. We, we never have rectitude of intention once and for all. Um, it's again and again, during every day, we need to rectify our intention to, toward God. What's my aim? It's love of God. Um, it's, you know, when you drive a car, you can, for a short time, let go of the steering wheel. You shouldn't, but, you know, you can, and it'll stay more or less on track. 
Uh, but if you're steering a boat and there are waves, you can't. Um, you, keep, you constantly have to correct the course. And, and so in our life too, we, we constantly have to keep our hands on the helm, which means, am I, am I approaching my aim? Am I going toward you? So, uh, Lord, let me find you in my work because I know if I don't find you in my everyday work, I will never find you. Find God in your work. Find God in your everyday work, in your, in your chores every day, or you will never find him. You will be constantly dreaming of some future occasion which will never come. When Jesus ascended to heaven, uh, the apostles were standing there and were looking up, and an angel came and said, why are you looking up to heaven? Uh, this Jesus whom you saw will come again. Go back to Jerusalem. You know? And he was sending them back to work. You know? don't, don't, don't think it's only uh, here in church. You know? uh, find Jesus in the middle of the world. Be contemplative in your work, as St. Joseph, Joseph was. Thank you for your patience. Um, let's just give, let's just have a few minutes of silence and thank God for the thoughts he gave us, maybe some resolution, some inspiration, some affection, and then I'll be happy to take questions or you know, hear your comments, your experiences, your witness. all the way in the back. Simple question. Will we work in heaven? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> um, we'll, well, in heaven we will be seeing God. We, we won't be working in the sense of finishing creation because creation will already be fulfilled and perfected by God. So, no, uh, we, we, we will be just enjoying God uh, directly without, you know. But new earth and new heaven, it won't be, we won't be idle, you know. There, we will be doing something, of course, right? <laughs> let's, let's, I don't know, good question. I've never thought of that, whether we'll be working. I only know that the priest will be out of work <laughs> because you don't need the sacramental church anymore because you, you know, we, we see God from face to face as he is, so, um, but we'll be doing other things. <laughs> Would you consider uh, gardening or woodworking or cooking or painting, just doing your hobbies and things you enjoy? Could that be considered work as well? Well, um, of course, those activities are work, right? Um, what made me think of it is the word hobby, okay? So I think the, the, um, what defines work 
is that it is a serious activity that serves others and is fulfilled with a sense of obligation. So if something is pastime or hobby, uh, it depends how you exercise it. So for instance, if you garden and it embellishes your house and it makes your family happy, then that would be work. Um, same with cooking, you know, music, all these things. Uh, if it's just for yourself, then maybe not. Okay. I have a question about. Um can prayer or liturgy or reading and gaining knowledge of the faith, can that be used as a distraction from work at hand? And then if so, I guess, how do we, do you have any helpful tips for how we can discern that line? So the question was, can prayer and liturgy be a distraction from work? Is that correct? Well, no. I would say that liturgy and prayer is actually the aim. Uh, we want to be in God's presence. We offer our work up and we, do, we bring it into mass when the priest elevates the pattern and says, we thank you for the bread, the fruit of the earth and the work of human hands. Our work is in there. Um, so what can be the case is that we do too many devotions. So, you know, kind of, I don't know, I'm inventing somebody. You know, somebody says, well, I'll go to Mass four times a day. I'll pray 27 rosaries, and I'll pray the Stations of the Cross three times a day, you know. And then um, kind of avoids fulfilling the duties at home or in work. That person would not be giving glory to God, except if it's, you know, kind of a very special vocation, which, you know, I, but kind of a normal layperson couldn't do that and shouldn't do that. Does that answer your question? Does that, yeah. Um, how, how do you combat boredom in work? Could you say that again? Uh, how do you combat boredom in work? How do you combat boredom in work? Well, um, so boredom is a form of tiredness. And it is something that comes up again and again. And up to a certain degree, it's inevitable that we get tired. Okay? So what I would ad advise is that you, you speak w with a spiritual guide or individually so that you can get some advice that is personal. Like speaking generally, however, I would say it, it always helps to take a step back and to see the bigger picture, to realize, well, what I do, and it seems to be very re you know, repetitive, always the same thing, actually serves a much greater purpose and it's really worth it and and you can tell our Lord um, and as soon as you put in your heart and you renew your love you will see that boredom kind of goes away it's rediscovering the purpose and the meaning of, of what we're doing um, that you know gives us new sense I'd like to ask a follow-up question to the, um, the idea that you pointed out how Jesus was um, crucified with the materials and the tools of his work. 
I thought about the, um, the punishment for Adam in the garden was to go work and it would bring forth thorns and thistles. And then that's what our Lord was crowned with on the cross. So I wonder, is there some deeper theology or some connection that can kind of expand some of these connections? Well, I, I think Father Johnson can answer that question <laughs> because he's, <laughs> he's a specialist in Holy Land. But, <laughs> but there's, you know, when you go to Golgotha, they show you, you know, where the, tradition, the legend says that Adam and Eve was buried, or Adam was buried. So it's like the garden, the tree of life is the cross. And uh, like the, the devil... Uh, fooled us into eating the fruit of the tree and Jesus uh, vanquished the devil with a tree in the garden. So there is, there, it's, it's, it's an undoing of what, of what sin is. Uh, first sin of disobedience, Christ ob obeys on the cross. You know, uh, the devil attacks him uh, in the desert with concupiscence and on the cross with the irascible passions. He wants to make him rebel against God's will. He wants to elicit an act of hatred, uh, an act of anger. And, you know, every word of Jesus is love on the cross. And um, that's why the early Christians considered the cross to be a trophy. You know, in, in antiquity, uh, when the enemy was vanquished, uh, at the place where the enemy turned around, in, in Greek, trepomai or trop, tropomai, whatever, they, they made a, a heap of the weapons of the enemy, and they called it tropion, the, the turning point. And then they carried those weapons in triumph uh, before them. And so the cross is actually the devil's weapon, and he lost. And so we Christians, we carry the cross as a sign of triumph. It's our triumphal procession, uh, the cross, you know. So, um, yeah. Monsignor, I'll ask a follow-up question myself. How do you counsel people uh, who tend to romanticize the notion of career? You know, uh, maybe the person that is peeling the potatoes that you described earlier and hasn't yet come to that notion of I'm sanctifying myself within this work of peeling potatoes. The person who just says, my fingers are soggy and wrinkled and the water is cold and this is the nine millionth potato I've, <laughs> I've done. There's something wrong with my life. I should be curing cancer. I should be solving Middle East peace. Uh, you know, but the people that not just about the, the money, the salary of a career, but that, this, that the career itself would be the, the, the source of happiness. Uh, and, I, and I think that in, in America, uh, as this romanticization of career is, is something that many people struggle with mm -hmm. and then can't deal with the fact that careers are not always exciting and uh, in that way. Well, I'll count that as an act of humility that you ask, Father Johnson. I'm sure you have the much better answer than I can uh, give. But, um, uh, well, you know, it's, I, I think it's also a question of personal maturity. I think we all have a time where we think, oh, I have to make a career, you know, or I have to, or my happiness consists in rising, and then you rise a bit, and then you see, well, that wasn't all too great, you know. And then you start thinking, well, maybe life is, is, is you know, is more meaningful than, than just uh, make a career. And then you also see what happens to other people who get fooled in, in, into thinking their happiness is in, in making a career, and you, you're not dumb, you know, you're, you, 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 you see, and I think more and more young people are opting for meaningfulness and for purpose and for personal relationships. And um, so there's this famous sociological study called The Habits of the Heart by Robert Bella, 
in the 1980s where he was studying American culture and the struggle between individualism and a sense of community. And he said, um, uh, at least in the 1980s, he said Americans distinguish between job, career, and calling. And job is just money, career is like a path, and, but what people really desire and really dream of is a calling. It's like having something that gives meaning and purpose and fullness to their life. And they're willing to leave their career in order to follow their calling. It's just a question, you know, do I dare? Do I dare? You know? So that, I think I would, enc I would encourage people to follow their calling rather than to do their career. We'll be happier if we follow our calling. Senior, my name is Mary. Hi, Mary. And um, thank you for your youthfulness huh? and your joyfulness. Just um, first of all, the young gentleman in the back, when he asked you if we were going to have work in heaven, what was um, St. Teresa's um, famous quote about I'll be doing more in heaven after she dies? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what many saints say that they'll be more active in heaven. Oh yeah, that is for sure. Okay. But the question is, will we be working? Okay. You know? But we'll certainly be more active. That is, that is very clear. We'll be much more, um, we'll be able to do much more good. You know, that, that's what Sister Faustina saw, that when you know, that God put her on a throne and she was able to distribute graces. To, to all people, right? Mary, I interrupted you, sorry. Was that your question, or did you want to say a bit more? Okay, like when Father was talking about um, career and then calling, um, on a personal note, um, I've been married 40 years to a wonderful man, and um, we've raised seven boys and one girl. Congratulations. I, thank you, Father. And. Um, but I, we had made the decision for me to leave my career to become a mother at home. And I believe that there's been a dehuman, human, and a hum, oh, Father, how do you say it? Dehumanizing of the, the mother at home. I mean, as far as saying the comments to me has always been, well, you don't work. And I thank you for that um, clarification of the career and then um, also the calling. So, um, but then on a side note, um, what do you think of the author, um, Louis de Wohl? Is he, have you read much of him? I've read some things, they're very good. I, I like his books. He, dis he usually writes biographies of saints. So I think he's a recommendable author. Yeah, but you know, Mary, your work as mother is certainly work. <laughs> that, in the full sense of the word, so that is very sanctifiable <laughs> and very sanctifying. And lots of crosses, yes. Well then, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for listening in. If you were uh, following our conversation on via internet, and uh, let's just uh, finish with a prayer and trusting ourselves to the Holy Family, to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us.